praise you, God. You are worthy, Lord, to be praised and magnified, God, and be lifted up, Lord. God, you protect our past. You guard our past, God. You show us light in our past, Lord. Help us, God, to not be afraid of receiving your grace in our lives. Help us, God, to not be afraid of accepting the blessings that you are given us. Help us, God, just to be ready and prepare ourselves for what you've got in store for us, God. Help us, God, to climb up higher than we've ever been. Help us, God, to have the courage and boldness to keep on pursuing you, Lord. Help us, God, to never be content with where we're at, God, but continue pursuing you, Lord. Oh, in Jesus' name, thank you, God. God, we ask that you will bless this offering, Lord, and that you'll continue to bless us, God, for you say as we have that you will give us more abundantly and multiply us, Lord, as we continue to give to you, God. We ask that you will bless and touch us in this offering. In Jesus' name we pray. If you have an offering, you may bring it up now.
Sarg God is good. Our God is great. That was beautiful. That last part there, that really got my emotions flowing, that's for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Taylor, for leading us in worship. Did an amazing, amazing job. Sister Alexis, Brother Stephen, Brother Aaron, y'all do so amazing. We are so blessed to have y'all. Love you, brother. Announcements, we got men's prayer tomorrow night at 7 p.m. We're going to have church this Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we're going to have night of worship this Friday at 8 p.m. And there's going to be food and fellowship to follow. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, if you don't mind. If you're going to show up to this, we ask that you bring something. Bring some food. Brother Phelps was here during Sunday school, but he had to leave because he, he was feeling ill. So we're going to pray for Brother Phelps. Brother Marcos had a seizure the other day, and he's in a hospital. So we're going to keep him in our prayers. We love Brother Marcos and Brother Phelps. And Sister Melissa is feeling kind of sick today. So we're going to pray for her as well. And Pastor and his family. We're going to pray for Pastor and his family. So uh, one of the members in his family, uh, they believe they caught COVID. So they are out today because they were in close contact. They're not feeling any symptoms. They're not sick. But just to be safe and cautious, they decided to stay back for today. So let's bring Brother Phelps, Brother Marcos, Sister Melissa, and Pastor and his family before the Lord today in prayer. In Jesus' name, God, we come before you, God. We ask that you will touch Brother Phelps in his illness, God, that you will touch him, Lord, and give him healing and comfort in his life right now and in his body, God. We ask that you will touch Brother Marcos, God, and restore him, Lord, and restore his body and his mind and his spirit, Lord. God, we ask that you will touch the doctors, God, give them wisdom and discernment, God, to give the right diagnosis, Lord, to give him the right treatment, Lord. In Jesus' name, we're asking that you will touch Sister Melissa, Lord. Touch her, God, and give her healing right now, Lord, and give her comfort right now, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask that you will touch pastor's family and that there will be no serious consequences from the COVID, God, and that it will not spread to anybody else and it will not spread to pastor and his family, Lord. We come before you, God, asking and pleading, God. In Jesus' name, we're believing in a miracle, God. We're believing in healing. In Jesus' name, let's give a hand clap to the Lord. Yes, Jesus. My little, my little child. Because Pastor's not here, although Pastor is a huge blessing to this church and his ministry and what he does, the, the way God uses him up here is a blessing. Can't we all agree on that? God uses our pastor. But there's another man that God uses even mightily as well. Now, I'm not going to say more mighty or anything like that. I don't know how God works. But however, God uses this man very mightily. This man has mentored me in many different ways. And I believe he can mentor all of us if we're willing to receive it and listen. So let's give a round of applause as Brother Glenn steps to the stage and ministers the word of God to us. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. All glory to the one who sits on the throne. Amen. 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 I always come to church with a duty. I always come to church with something that God has required of me. I never walk through those doors without an intention to serve God in some form or capacity. Amen. Truth be told, I never wake up without that, that intention. Every day I actively seek people uh, to, to, to minister to. I, I try to find people to talk about God to. Um, I made a remark last night. We were having Christmas dinner at my in-laws house down there in Fort Walton pastor gave me a call let me know what was going on asked me if I'd be available to preach I prayed about it I said yes I um but I made a remark to my in-laws there at the dinner table I said you know to me I've never been somebody who had a great desire to be a preacher it never really appealed to me, maybe when I was a young man. I didn't have as much knowledge as I do now, I guess. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'm any smarter than I used to be, but uh, you can be seated this morning, by the way. I don't have an opening scripture. I just got an opening <clears throat> rant. Praise God. You'll be all right. 
<laughs> but I told him, I said, it never appealed to me. I said, you know, so, so to me, my ministry is always, I've always seen ministry as something outside of the walls of the church as well as within them. Uh, but that's always been what's appealed to me is reaching people in this world, finding people who are in need, finding people who are hurt, who are broken, because that's how God found me. God didn't find me on a pew one day, praising him. God found me in some, some bad things. And so those are the people I try to reach. Those are the people I try to find. Uh, but my point being is that uh, I always walk into this church with, a, with a, a duty to God, with something that I intend to do, whether it be praise, whether it be teach. Um, but this morning, just one more thing on that list would be to preach today. That's the only difference to me. Uh, still the same God, the same church. Uh, and you're all still the same people. Maybe a little better than before, hopefully. Maybe after this. Uh, well, I just hope you're... Uh, not sleeping. Praise God. <laughs> you know, we spoke about Pastor and his family, and uh, of course, they were in contact with someone they believe could have COVID. I don't think there was any test results involved, but out of precaution, they weren't, they're not here with us this morning. And so, of course, we respect that and we appreciate that. When I talked to him last night, he said, if there was someone in the church who had told me that their circumstance or what they had been through the way that we have over these last couple of days with um, somebody potentially being sick, he said, I, I would expect them to stay home. He said, so I'm going to do the same thing, you see. So our pastor is not a man who does not practice what he preaches. And so he is a man who lives what he says. Um, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate him giving me the opportunity to minister this morning. I, I never run from an opportunity to serve God. Uh, it talks about that in the Bible. It says that you should always seek a way to serve the Lord. But COVID... Over the last couple of years, COVID has done a number on this world. It has changed a lot of things. Um, and I do believe that the time and the day and age that we live in, uh, excuses seem to run rampant. Uh, there seems to be a lot of things that people can't do for a lot of reasons. And I feel like when COVID came around, that was just one more reason. I feel like it was something that happened, Lord willing, I do believe that. But I do believe a lot of people use it as an excuse. You see, a lot of people, they have a desire to be sedentary and allow their lives to be underwhelming. And I hope that we all don't reside in that place, but we've all been in that place. I've been there. I've been there. I didn't feel like doing anything. I wasn't living up to what God called me to be. I made excuses. And I found myself in a place I didn't want to be. The title of my message today is The Birth of Our Favor. Christmas just passed. It was yesterday. And of course, we had the birth of our Savior. We know this. So I just did a little play on words there. See, hey, I, I ain't too fancy, but every now and then I get a little slick on y'all. So as COVID's going on, it started back in 19, hence the name, we know this. Businesses started to be affected by it. At first, we didn't know how it was gonna play out. We move on through the year 2020. Places start to close down. Countries start to lock down and the world stops. There's no travel, at least very little. Um, Non-essential things almost don't exist. People are afraid to go to the store. Um, on and on it goes. There's panic that sets in. The word pandemic is used. Uh, for the first time in a lot of conversations. Um, it's not something new, but it's new to us in this lifetime that we live, um, or at least on such a grand scale. And so businesses start to become affected and they start to close down hundreds of thousands. Um, I was reading, doing some research for this sermon and there were even as many as 200,000 businesses that permanently closed. I'm not talking about closed down and then reopened, I mean, for good, for good, hundreds of thousands. I mean, that's <laughs> got to be at least one person at the business. So, you know, it was more than a couple hundred thousand people <laughs> that lost their jobs. And we know numbers, there was millions. Some of them, 
how do I say this? Some of them probably didn't have a job to go to. Others just didn't want to. You pick, if you didn't get that, you'll, pick, you'll get it before you, you, later on. So hard times and inability operate and allow for such an outcome. And it's understandable. Some people had to close their doors. They couldn't do business. I knew a story of a guy who spent his whole life savings on starting a business two months before COVID happened, and he lost it all. The business he was in, he wasn't able to operate the way that he had intended. He went into it. He quit his job. He did these types of things. And, and, and the guy is, 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 is jam up. He's a great guy. And he had, he had a plan. He had it all worked out. Believe me, he didn't go into it by the seat of his pants. But what happened was he was unable to be successful due to circumstances beyond his control. Or so it would seem. And I'm not trying to bash the fellow this morning or anybody else. Because I understand what hard times look like. I do. But I know what favor looks like too. And favor is just a little bit more than those hard times. And I'm here to tell somebody that this morning. When you're motivated by the favor of God, when you reside in the favor of Jesus Christ, there's no, there's no pandemic. There's no hard time. There's no lost job that can stop God's favor. Somebody hear me this morning. But you know what? You got to want it a little bit. You got to want it just a little bit. And you know what we do, just as I had mentioned with COVID, we find excuses and we find ways just to weasel out of it. We find ways just to slip away from a responsibility or for something that God wanted us to do. We accept it. We accept it. You see, the, the action word there is acceptance, which is what we do. It's what you do. It's what I do. It doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. You see, there's no one that can decide for you to or to not accept your circumstance. I'll say that again. No one in this world, not your spouse, not your kids, not your parents, not your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your pastor. No one in this world can decide whether or not you accept where you're at right now. Right now today. In the same breath, no one in this world can motivate you to change where you're at right now today. Only you can do that. And I hope that someone this morning would understand that upon making that decision to change where you are and to become something greater than you've ever been, God's favor does rest upon you and no one can change that. You see, <laughs> only you can change where you're at right now and become greater than you've ever been. No one can change God's favor that's upon you. If it comes from those around you that are dependent on you or whether it's due to a longing to be effective or to be great, sometimes we go to work because we know we have mouths to feed. Sometimes we go to work because we know we have bills to pay. Sometimes we go to work to escape maybe our situation at home. Sometimes we go to work because we're bored. There's a lot of different things. But we seek and we, 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 we delve into a life that we expect to benefit us, whether it be financially, whether it be emotionally, perhaps physically. Um, there's a lot of people who go to work just to stay in shape, just to get up, just to move around, keep the blood flowing. Whatever it is, there's a motivation that, 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 that is persistent within us to get us off the couch or out of bed every day. Right? right? Yeah. Unless we find something like COVID or something the like that we feel is good enough reason not to do that. If you're not where you want to be in God this morning, I want to tell you that it's because you found a good enough reason not to be. You see, God's favor, as I've mentioned, can overcome it all. <laughs> you see, a Savior was born <laughs> so that we could live. He lived 33 years and died so that we could be redeemed. 
so that our salvation would, <laughs> would not be in question. A spotless lamb that was sacrificed upon a cross. February 3rd was the first hint of disaster for a company that I'm going to speak of. Joe Davey, he was the 31-year-old CEO of Bonsai International Incorporated. And he was concerned because everything was getting locked down. Everybody was staying inside of their homes. And he happened to run a business that orchestrated, designed, and implemented conferences. Face-to-face, person-to-person. So he was quite worried. So in 2019, they had over 100 clients, this firm that he worked for, that he was a CEO for, including Dell Technologies, Adobe, large, large companies. By March 13th, February 3rd, now we're at March 13th of 2020, our entire sales pipeline was gone, he's quoted as saying. He said, only 13% of the company's revenue came from internet meetings, an afterthought, and many of its competitors felt the same way. The rest was from face-to-face, press-to-flesh, meet-and-greet events. So you have a man who is a CEO, so not only is he responsible for his own income, his own family, but he has a responsibility because if you've never been in management or you've never been in ownership of a company that employs people, you have a direct responsibility to those under you or not necessarily under you, but those who work with you that you are managing for their, for their livelihood as well, at least if you're a good leader, you do. Right? You feel the weight of that. You feel the pressure of that. So as the CEO, he feels this. Okay? He says, February 3rd, it, it all started to go sideways. About a month and 10 days later, we'll say five weeks. Five weeks later, he said, we didn't have anything going on. 13% of our business was online. And uh, you don't have to be a mathematician to understand that 13% ain't going to do it. Barely pay your taxes. Probably, probably not, actually, as a corporation. But nonetheless... So something's wrong. Something's very wrong. No one's going to conferences. No one's seeing each other, and he's worried, as I'm sure everyone else is. So not knowing whether in-person greetings would come back in six months or two years, he and his executive team decided not to wait to shift the company's focus. But they didn't know how to do that. All they knew how to do were set up conferences where people meet and greet each other, set up fancy displays, perhaps screens, events, meet and greet, before and after. He didn't know how to do anything online. So I'm painting a picture for you this morning so that you'll understand this. It was a dire need. And the only solution that he could come up with was something that he had never done and didn't know how to do. Hmm. Somebody in the house this morning has a dire need in their life. And I'm here to tell you, the solution might be something that you don't know how to come up with or have never done. But listen to God this morning. So what they do is, they say, hey, look, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to do this. Let's find somebody who does. So they do. They bring in another company. Said it took them 72 hours of talking over a few days. It was only 72 hours in a few days. So they must have been like locked in the same room together. So they, they made an acquisition of a company that this is what they specialized in. They brought them on. They brought them onto their team, brought them under their umbrella. And on August 25th, they now had about 90 employees, 10 from the acquisition they had made, and their calendar was heavily booked with virtual events, including big tech names like Google and Hitachi. He said, our volume of events has nearly doubled. This is in August. So we're about six months down the road. It was really fortunate that we were able to respond so quickly because this could have been a huge disaster for us. If we had done nothing and just decided to wait it out, we would be dead. Of course, he's speaking financially. <laughs> you see, this, this man, he was a 31-year-old man. He wasn't of great age, but perhaps of great wisdom. He was able to discern that there was things that, that the plane that they were on and had been on for a long time for things that they couldn't see coming was about to crash and burn. And unless they figured out how to pilot it in a different direction, they weren't going to make it. Somebody hear me this morning. The plane you might be on, the path that you might be on might be leading into a canyon, might be leading into your demise. And unless you change it today... You're not going to make it. 
But they did change it, you see. They made, the, <laughs> they made the necessary adjustments that they needed to make, and they were able to be better than ever. You see, he said, we have doubled our volume. See, not only were they able to maintain what they had, but through a pandemic, through a crisis, when it looked like there was no way, I can't think of any better example. A company that literally specializes in face-to-face, person-to-person meetings, survives a lockdown. God will do it. Not only will he do it, he will do it twice as good as it used to be. And he will make a way for you where there is no way. (laughs) I'm talking about birth of some favor this morning. I'm talking about a desire to be better. I'm talking about a desire, a a longing, a fervor for favor. You know, the word fervor means intense desire. It's not a passive desire. When I see someone and I say, hey, thanks a lot. I don't really mean it. It's out of court. It's, it's, It's cordially, right? I'm not trying to be rude, of course, when I say it or sarcastic, but it's just something you say. Hey, thanks. You know, but I don't truly, I'm not truly in in such a great place of thankfulness to that person for holding the door for me. I do appreciate it. But the point I'm making is, (laughs) if your desire for favor is passive, it ain't going to get it done. But you can. That's what I'm here to tell you. There's no better time than right now. There's no better, (laughs) there's no better person than you. There's nothing greater than the inspiration of the divine. That God would step off of his throne and try to inspire you to be something you've never been. Better than you've ever been. Greater than yesterday, but not as great as tomorrow. And I know what you're saying. Well, that was them, big company. I'm me, I'm not them. But you're you and you're not them, so you can't change their life, but God can change yours. <laughs> you see, when we read these stories, when we recollect, even on the Bible, I'm not Paul and I'm not Peter, I'm me, but I know God and God is God. And although Paul and Peter cannot change my life, God can. God can put upon me the same favor that he put upon them. God is no respecter of persons, church. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you, where you are from. It doesn't matter what you look like, how tall, how short, how big and wide, or not. It doesn't matter how much money you have, how much money you've wasted. Your intelligence isn't a factor. Your physical ability is irrelevant. God is no respecter of persons, even unto himself. Even unto himself. Hmm. When Jesus was on earth, it said he was fully man and fully God. But he allowed himself to go through things so that he could relate to us. And the reason he did that was because he was no respecter of persons, even unto himself. That's another message for another time. Innately dismissive. The word innate means it's something that's in your nature. It means you don't have to try to do it. You just do it. My wife says that sometimes I am innately cold. She says, I don't have to try. I just am. (laughs) That's okay, though. I don't let it bother me. (laughs) But you are as a people. As a flesh, as our nature, it's innate in us. We dismiss it. Oh, that's them. That's not me. 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 Do you know why the Bible isn't filled with more stories? Because there were too many people who were innately dismissive. Because God healed. God moved. God was there. Jesus Christ was on the scene in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the flesh. But the reason, (laughs) there were too many people that said, that ain't me. That ain't me. Yeah, I heard about Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, can anything good come from Galilee? Hmm. They dismissed him. (laughs) I don't think you're hearing me this morning. Are you dismissing God? Are you dismissing God? Are you dismissing the path that he has intended for you to walk down? The cross that he has intended you to bear? The prosperity that he has withheld from you? 
the prosperity he has withheld from you because you are dismissive, because you don't want to say, oh, you know what? I can. You know what? He can. You know what? I could be the greatest. I could be the best. I could be used by God. I could be used by God. I could be used by God. I can be victorious like God. Hmm. He's never lost. He ain't going to start with you. But you see, the thing about it is we don't think we can recreate greatness. We don't believe. We don't really, truly believe and conceptualize what it means to be great, to be like the great I am. He said, I will make you in my likeness. I will breathe my breath into you that you will be like me. When Jesus was on earth, he said, greater things than these you will see. But we don't believe it. We don't believe it. We just read it as words on a page. Huh. Like green eggs and ham. I don't believe it. I never seen a green ham. I never seen green eggs. At least not that was cooked. I've seen some green egg shells. But the point is we treat it like that, don't we? <laughs> because we don't believe it. We just read it. We don't live it. Because to us, it's for everyone else. We pass the buck. But God did not come down and manifest himself in flesh for greatness to be selective. Hmm. I'll say it again. The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who hung the stars in the universe, did not step down off his throne of glory to allow greatness to be selective. <laughs> he died for you. He died for me. He lived for you. He lived for me. He is no respecter of persons. His favor is unrelenting. His favor is not selective. I hope we walk out of here this morning with the motivation to live and operate in the favor of God. You've convinced yourself you tried your best. You really believe that. You might be the only one who believes that. I'm not trying to beat anybody up this morning. I'm trying to motivate you. I'm trying to motivate you to be the best you can be because that's who God intended you to be. You think God formed you out of clay, brought you from the muck just so you could be average? You think God... <laughs> You think when God looked to his side, when he hung on that cross and he saw a criminal that no one else could care for. And he said, you believe I am who I say I am. You will be with me this day in heaven. You think that same God full of grace and mercy and limitless power created you to be mundane. In the Bible, it says that in the last days we will experience a great revival Huh. And those who are involved in that, this is commentary now, but those who are involved in that will be great people. <laughs> it says that a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You can witness a revival without being a part of it. In chapter five of the book of Luke, verses four through five, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, known as Peter, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, he said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. That last line, it really gets me. Because what he's telling him is, I've tried my best, God, I've tried my best. We've been fishing all night. We've been doing this a long time. You just showed up. Huh. 
God, I've been fishing my whole life. My daddy was a fisherman and his daddy's daddy too. And these boys that are with me, same thing. You just showed up. But because I believe you, I'll let the net back down. And we all know what happened. I had to drag it to shore there was so many fish in the thing. But just like Peter, we really believe we tried our best. We really believe that. God has a different perspective. <laughs> you see what happened there in that boat was a man with a mission, Peter, but he couldn't accomplish his mission without God. Amen. So he tried and he tried and he tried and to say that he tried his best could be accurate, but it wasn't God's best. Huh. And I do believe that the favor of God was upon that net and upon those fish. <laughs> but we convince ourselves that we've done, I've tried that. I've tried that. I tried and I tried and I tried. I couldn't make it. I couldn't make it. I had to give up. There was no other way. I failed. Here I am. You know, failure isn't an option for God. It's only an option for you and me. <laughs> Failure isn't an option for God. I'll say it again. It's only an option for you and me. He's a God of victory, eternal victory. You see, and I do believe that in the boat that night, God had to think to himself. He had to say something along these lines. <sighs> Man, one day they're going to write this story down somewhere. And we're going to need to catch some fish. So here you go, have a net full of them. You see, because God is eternal, God does not operate in things that perish. <laughs> God's favor is also eternal. Everything about Jesus Christ is forever. There's nothing that God does that is temporary. Remember that. If you don't remember anything else I say today, remember that. Prayer is eternal. Praise is eternal. The word of God is eternal. God manifest and dying for our sins is eternal. Hmm. You know, in science, they say it like this. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed because when God made it, it was forever. Everything God does is forever. But praise God. So then boys caught a slew of fish. And they had a good old time, and then they followed Jesus everywhere he went. A little bit of water walking in there, too. But my point being is, they thought they had tried everything. So if you think you've tried everything in a situation today, I want you to pray. I want you to pray about it again. I want you to bring it back to God again. I want you not to give up. Because if there's anything inhibiting your walk with God, it's not of God. Huh. I'm talking about jobs. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about situations. I'm not saying God can't mend it. I'm not saying God can't fix it because he will. But the thing about it, to, to give up, to say that it's a failure, to wash your hands of it and to walk away. What if God would have done that to you? You see, he wouldn't. <laughs> and he's not going to let you fail. Where feet may fail. There is God. I want to talk about a fellow by the name of Ehud, E-H-U-D. I pronounced Ehud. Anyway, I don't spell his name. Y'all can look him up. He was a judge. He was the second. And Judges chapter 3, verse 12 through 30. I'm not going to read them all. I, look, I could tell there was a little bit of angst there when I said that number. I, could, I felt it in the spirit. 12 through 30, someone was trying to do quick math, and man, that's 18 verses. Whoa, whoa. Man, we, what time we we went to lunch? Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave King Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms, also known as Jericho. The Israelites were subject to the king, of Mo, the king of Moab for 18 years. 18 years. Yours? Year, hey. Either way. 
18 years. All right, so they're, they're caught up. They're tied up. They're in a bad situation. This guy done came in, got, got, got a bunch of Israel's enemies together, took over Jericho. Here we are. All right, 18 years has went by. I, I can't help but to think there were some people within that city that had become very passive and had forgotten about the favor of God because... In order for that to happen, for 18 years to go by, you have to at some point accept defeat, I would think. Because I tell you, 18 years of something is a long time, at least to me. I mean, I don't plan on, I'm, I'm probably not going to live real, real long. So that's a good portion of my life, and I would prefer it not to be miserable. So as with the judges, here's what happens. Israel acts up, they act a fool. God sends a judge to get them back, right? Okay, that's, that's how judges goes. If you're wondering, that's paraphrased. There's a lot to it, but here we are. <laughs> so they cried out. They said, God, send us somebody. Send us somebody. So here comes Ahud. And it said that he was left-handed. If you, if you research, there's a couple of different things. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, who were known to be left-handed. But in the Bible... It says, it translates to having two right hands when they speak of him. So a lot of theologians, scholars, they think he was uh, crippled in his right hand. Okay, and they think that he was not a man of very um, proficient physical stature. So he ends up putting a blade on the inside of his right leg and going to get an audience with the king. And I'm, again, paraphrasing for time. And so he walks in, they check him, they shake him down, but the left side in that time and that day was considered deceptive or dark, if you will. So they saw that he was left-handed, and that's why we, a lot of them think that he had a condition with his right hand because they immediately knew he was left-handed. But um, they didn't even really check him. They were like, oh, okay, he's left-handed, you know, um, not really any threat, uh, didn't really look the part of being somebody who was there to um, assassinate the king. Uh, so they kind of just let him pass through. But that's what happens. He goes into the chamber with the king and he was, he was pretty sharp. He said, hey, I got to tell you a secret. Get him every time with that secret, I tell you. Every time you get somebody thinking you're telling them a secret, they're going to listen. Everybody want to know the secrets. Not everybody want to know the truth, though. So he gets him alone, all the guards go out, stabs him, kills him. Okay, point is, no one thought he could do anything. No one thought he was capable. No one thought he was anything of anything, but he ended up saving them. And it says that after that, they had peace for 80 years, 18 to 80. So they were in bondage for 18 years. This guy shows up who no one thinks nothing about, who, who, who they look at him and say, oh, pff, let him through, he ain't gonna do nothing. He ends up killing the king, and he gives them peace, Israel, the people of Israel, peace for 80 years. Hmm. I hope that everybody in this room has some type of legacy that will last 80 years. Don't be so foolish as to think God can't use you because of your faults. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Be motivated to be great. Don't look at yourself and disqualify yourself. Look at God and understand that you can because he can. But will you? And I want to tell somebody you ain't too dirty. Even if you're living in sin, God will find you. God will find you. I'll remind you of a man named Paul. He was on the road to Damascus to go kill people. Christians, as a matter of fact. And he had a history of that. And that was his intention. Because what he said was, hey, get with the synagogue over there in Damascus. Because Paul traditionally was Jewish. And so he said, hey, get with the synagogue. See what's going on. I'm going over there. And we're going to, you know, take care of business. He said, I'm going to do what I always do. Pull them out. Behead them. Whatever it takes. This new theology that's coming around, I don't like it. I don't want nothing to do with it. Anyone who does, I'm killing them. So he goes to Damascus. On his way there, he gets blinded. God speaks to him. He says, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said, arise, go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And they went after they stood speechless because he had men with them. They went and they found a particular house and God spoke to Ananias and he said, go to straight street to the house of Judas and you will find him. And Ananias said, no, 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 no. I know this guy. I know this guy. He ain't right. He's out here killing us, God. What are you talking about? And he said, go find him. He's my chosen. He has been chosen. How many times have you said unto yourself, no, 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 God, it ain't me. It ain't me. I'm too messed up. I got too much going on. You got it wrong, God. I'm in a bad way. But he told Ananias, he said, that's my man. Go see him. And he did, and he prayed for him. And it says something as, as of scales fell off of his eyes. Shortly after, Paul began to minister and wrote over half of the New Testament. <laughs> you ain't too dirty. You're not caught up in something so severe that God's favor cannot find you. Hmm. I don't care what it is. And neither does God. It don't really matter what I care about and don't care about. What I care about is trying to motivate somebody today to understand that you could be as great as Paul. I mean, this is a man, he was on his way to kill people. I mean, that, think about it. Are you sitting here blind and planning to kill folks? I'll pray for you. But God came down and intervened and made him great. Made him who he intended him to be. Not who Paul intended to be. Who God intended him to be. God came down and after he blinded him and got him right a few days later, he poured out his favor upon him. And Paul was baptized. And I'll close with this story. It's a man by the name of William Carey. Some of you might have heard of him. He's fairly well known. Um, after today, you will all have heard of him, even if he is not well known. But <laughs> he was an unlikely hero. He was a stuttering plotter. What that means is that he couldn't talk, but he liked to think a lot. And he tried his best. To plod means to slowly accomplish something. It means that it might take you a really long time to do it, but piece by piece, inch by inch, minute by minute, day by day, year by year, you are plotting. You are moving just a little more and a little more, and that's who he was, and he couldn't speak. He's had a bad stutter. The only job he could manage to get was as a shoemaker's apprentice, and the only girl that would marry him was Dorothy, who suffered from mental illness. But everything changed for Willie when he read a book. It's called Captain Cook's Journal. And he saw human needs in faraway places. He lived in England. But he fashioned a crude globe made of leather straps and stared at it day after day. And he said, here I am, Lord, send me. But there, there, there were no foreign missionaries back in the 1700s. When he stammered out his vision at a meeting, an old pastor angrily shouted, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without you or me. Others tried to dissuade him by reminding him that he was a shoemaker married to a crazy woman. And people even told him, face it, William, you're unfit. And he stuttered, but, 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 but I can, I can, I can plod. For the next 11 years, he did just that. He plotted until he could read the Bible in Latin, Greek, Dutch, and French. He was finally licensed to preach. And when he wasn't in the pulpit of his tiny church, he rode across England, stuttering a single message. You see, God didn't need him to be healed of his stutter to use him. But this is what he said. As he stuttered his message, he said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. 
With that credo as his fortification, he gathered like-minded pastors and established a mission society. Yet he was so poor that he couldn't even contribute a single penny. Somehow he managed to collect a handful of missionaries and pitiful resources and made a trip to India in the late 1700s. They might as well have been going to the moon. His wife sat on the dock refusing to leave. Twice he had to get on his knees and beg her to board the ship. When the missionaries arrived, Hindu radicals tried to kill him. The British East Indies Company refused to let them travel inland. And his five-year-old son died and his wife completely lost her mind. He stayed in India and labored for seven years before he saw his first conversion. <laughs> you see, the story began with a description of Willie that I expounded upon briefly and I told you he was someone who would plod. You see, and what that says is he was a man of patience, but he was a man of determination. It took him seven years before he had his first conversion. You see, God couldn't send anybody. <laughs> he had to send Willie because he was the man for the job. Because he knew that even if it took seven years, he would do it. <laughs> After 20 years, he had only a handful of converts. His first wife had passed away and then a second. But he continued to plod. When he died in 1834 at age 73, he had translated the Bible into 34 languages. Founded India's first college, established 45 teaching centers, and alleviated famine by teaching new agricultural methods and labored tirelessly to free Indian women from the cruelest sorts of bondage. If you visit India today, you can find a statue near the nation's parliament building. Even people of the Hindu faith celebrate him as one of their country's greatest heroes. History recalls by him by his proper name, William Carey. He, he's been dubbed the father of modern missions. But he would be more impressed to know that some 27 million Indians embrace Christ. <laughs> and that there's five times more evangelicals in India than in England, where he came from, where no one believed in him, where everyone told him his wife's crazy, you don't have a job that can make any type of pay, you stutter, Willie, you're slow, you'll never be nothing. But God used him and God poured his favor out upon him because Willie had a desire and a belief that he could be great. And he had a God who would make him great. Huh. As long as you can see it, you can do it. Expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. You see, this man was nobody. He could barely speak. <laughs> and he made a journey, lost his son, took seven years to finally make his first conversion. But he had a promise from God. And he had a belief that was so embedded in his spirit that he could be great. Expect great things from God. Do great things for God. You see, the favor of God was upon William Carey and what he was able to accomplish. And the fact that there were 27 million, over five times as many, <laughs> as the place he had came, lets me know that he left this world a better place. But it's because not only did he have a belief in God, but despite everything that everyone around him told him of his shortcomings, of his failures, of his disqualifications, and why he couldn't be anything, despite it all, he knew that God's favor would override it all. You see his tagline, it wasn't expect things, do things. It was expect great things, do great things. You see this man was a man who had a perspective of greatness. He knew who God had intended him to be and he knew what God had intended him to do. It wasn't something passive. It wasn't something simple. And in the end, it wasn't those things either, but it was great. It was great. that. <laughs> The 45 teaching centers, the statue near Parliament, all those things are wonderful.
but the millions of people who were able to hear the truth and receive the word of Jesus because of this man is really what's amazing. But what's even more amazing is the God who enabled him to do those things is the same God who resides within you. Expect great things, church. Do great things. God is not a God that is simplistic in such a way that he would allow you to be barred from greatness. <laughs> it's a simple concept, but it's complex to understand. God is great and so are we because he made us in his likeness. So altar's open this morning. But I wanted to share what God had put on my heart. Don't let life pass you by, but even more so, don't let the opportunity to be great in God's favor get swept away like something in the wind. We will hold an account one day. And we'll look our maker in his eye and he'll speak to us. There's a lot of things that can be said a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of principles that we do have to adhere by, but please hear me today. You are not normal, simple, mundane. You are great. Live greatly. Operate in the great spirit of God. Be more than you ever thought you could be. Believe that you can be because God believes in you. If there's anyone here this morning that wants to make a change in the way that they're living their life, and I'm not talking about you're full of sin, I'm talking about if anyone here this morning would like to come pray for greatness to reside within them and to rest upon them. I think about Elisha when he picked up the mantle of Elijah. Huh. You see, he understood what it meant because he had been with him. He had been with him and he knew that when he picked up that mantle, when he took it upon himself, that he was required to be great. There was nothing within him at that very moment that would allow him to believe that he was gonna be a regular person, a normal, a normalcy would no longer exist within his life. God is calling somebody today to pick up a mantle just like that. God is calling somebody today to understand and to believe in greatness within themselves as given by God and his spirit, that it would guide you, that it would direct you, that it would enable you and empower you to see people healed, to see the, day, the dead raised up. Huh. Jesus himself said, you will see greater things than these. Somebody this morning, believe that. Believe that because that's who what God intended. That's who God intended us to be. Amen. The altars are open. If you don't want to settle for anything less than greatness, I would encourage you to come pray this morning. That we would all aspire to be what God intended us to be. Great.
everything we got going on this week as we are dismissed uh, night of worship on Friday church on Wednesday uh, I don't think I'm missing anything uh, men's prayer tomorrow um, yeah be blessed y'all 
you know, just uh, never settle. We, you were made in his image to achieve something great and to be great. Hallelujah. Greatly dismissed in Jesus' name.